this panel along with many friends. And the panel is on digital rights protection in Latin America and Europe. And our goal is to, to build bridges. The overreaching theme of this meeting is building bridges. And I think with our panel, we're trying to do just that, build a huge bridge across the Atlantic between Europe and Latin America to find out which, in which ways we can protect digital rights in these challenging times. Um, we have, my introduction will be very brief. We have decided on a few specific topics to guide our conversation. We're going to try to discuss the issues that are happening specifically in both Europe and Latin America, issues such as neutrality, privacy, data protection, surveillance will probably be part of our conversation. And we will have a special focus on digital rights protection, meaningful ways uh, through which we can protect digital rights, mechanisms, remedies, and so on. So the, the format of, of the meeting is going to be like this. We're going to have very short presentations by the panelists. Um, I'm not going to waste any time presenting them. I will ask them to present themselves very briefly, please. And I will assign an order of, of, of presentations. Um, so I will, I will ask uh, Luca to begin, please, and introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Ramiro. Uh, my name is Luca Belli. I work at Celsa Sorbonne University in Paris. And um, I'm also serving as a network neutrality expert for the Council of Europe. And I am the founder of the Dynamic Coalition on Network Neutrality. Uh, I will speak about network neutrality. And uh, I think this topic lends itself very well to a comparison between Latin America and um, Europe, uh, because the first country in the world to enshrine network and writing legislation was a South American country, was Chile. The example of Chile was followed by uh, a bunch of uh, European countries, uh, Norway, uh, Slovenia and, and also Finland that has provisions that grant, grant uh, um, access to unfiltered internet. So I th and, and again, we have seen this dialogue between uh, Europe and, and uh, um, Latin America uh, that has been corroborated by the statement of uh, Dilma Rousseff uh, one month ago, saying that natural neutrality is, is one of her priority and that should be protected with the policy and legislation. So I would like to first uh, uh, define what is natural neutrality and then why it is important for human rights and for the protection of human rights online. So uh, natural neutrality was, uh, the, the expression of natural neutrality was uh, created by Tim Hu 10 years ago. Uh, he defined it as a, a natural design principle. So it's a, a principle according to which all uh, uh, content service, uh, services and uh, um, uh, platform should be treated in an, uh, in an equal fa fashion so that uh, uh, an user can enjoy universal access to the internet. And uh, this principle has been integrated by the Council of Europe in 2010 with the uh, Net Neutrality Declaration. So the Council of Europe has explicitly uh, stated its commitment to the net neutrality principle, saying that end users should have the greatest possible access to content, services, and applications of their choice. And this uh, is therefore a non-discrimination principle. So uh, the, this principle is extremely important because it defines how a network operator can manage internet traffic without discriminating specific uh, content, specific uh, uh, recipients, specific sender of information. There, has, there, are, there are obvious uh, uh, implications with regard to uh, a, a number of human rights, uh, according to the uh, discriminatory measures that are undertaken by the ISPs. So if you think about blocking, when an, an ISP blocks uh, a legal uh, application or service like a voice over IP or peer-to-peer -peer that are legal, uh, the ISP is in this moment uh, diminishing end users' right to receive and impart information and idea. So the ISP, when he is blocking Skype, for instance, 
it's, it, it is impeding uh, an end user to express himself and to communicate. It, um, I, don't, I don't have to remind that freedom of expression is protected both by the uh, Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights and Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Then if we uh, pass to another kind of discriminatory measures, filtering, that is based on analyzing traffic before deciding if to block it or prioritize it or downgrade it, we immediately understand that when, you, when we analyze the content of data packet, we uh, impinge upon end users' right to privacy of their communication. It's exactly as if a postman was opening a letter and checking the content to understand if he has to deliver it today or maybe tomorrow, or if he had to add some advertisement according to the content of the, of the envelope. So that is obvious consequence on uh, privacy and data privacy. So uh, it, that for our funda privacy is a fundamental right protected by Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights and Article 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And data privacy is protected by Convention 108 of the Council of Europe. And uh, I, would last, I, I will finish with uh, the last uh, uh, um, bullet point on uh, um, discriminatory measures uh, about throttling or prioritizing. Uh, we are hearing a lot of uh, uh, discussion today about prioritization, also because that will be, uh, it is allowed by the actual um, uh, regulation, proposal for regulation uh, that has been um, elaborated by, the, by the, uh, the European Commission. It allows for pay for priority offers, but when one can pay for priority, some content service will be uh, will have will enjoy a better quality because they will be prioritized, and other will have a, 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 a um, uh, less um, less efficient quality. So the uh, choice of the end user will be automatically uh, oriented towards some kind of information, some kind of ideas, and uh, pluralism, media pluralism, will be automatically affected. And media pluralism, the diversity of media content, are essential, essential for, for, the functioning, for the functioning of uh, uh, democracy and are essential corollary of freedom of expression. So uh, I think we have to uh, consider all these uh, issues and uh, I look forward to discuss it uh, further with you. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them. Thank you very much, Luca. Carlos Afonso, uh, would you take the floor, please? Sorry, how, how many minutes? Around uh, four to six minutes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm Carlos Afonso. I am a, a board member of CGI.br, uh, one of the four representatives of civil society organizations in the board. And uh, I am also, uh, I collaborate with an, a research institute in Rio called Instituto Nupef. Um, uh, I thank Luca for this good introduction. Uh, it saves me a few precious minutes. <laughs> uh, we are uh, currently in a, in a political struggle in Brazil to defend what we call the civil rights framework of the internet. This has been uh, originally based in a set of 10 principles which CGI.br, after two years of uh, going back and forth, approved by consensus. And uh, it's basically I the idea of having a charter of principles for the internet in Brazil, and uh, which would be a reference for bills of law, for regulations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The charter itself is not going to establish all rules, and the, the idea is not that at all. So one of the big fights we have actually is deciding what belongs to a charter and what be belongs to any specific law. Mm -hmm. This is a big challenge we are having. And I think that the three pillars which are basically being disputed by uh, the different groups is net neutrality, protection of privacy, and uh, one which is quite uh, relevant for us as well is uh, accountability of intermediaries. Now, I remember that in, in the IGF in Lithuania or Latvia, I don't remember. Uh, 
Um, a minister of defense in, uh, uh, of an European country said we have to make the networks accountable, accountable for content. Because uh, this is uh, the, uh, in the name of security and uh, in the name of uh, violations of rights, etc. And we are insisting that, that uh, you don't want to kill the messenger and you don't want to empower the, the messenger with uh, law enforcement. And sometimes there are bills of law, which Brazil itself is confronting now, that. Uh, uh, suggests that uh, this power be not uh, endowed, but imposed on, on internet service providers. So they have, in order to run the service, they have to accept the, you know, the sheriff uh, star here. And, uh, and if they don't, they will be accountable. And this is extremely serious and dangerous. You know? And uh, one of the key points of the civil rights framework is to make sure that the network is not accountable. The, they say responsible for any content are the generators of that content. No? And uh, <clears throat> another challenge we have is uh, that we have, uh, I don't know if you know, but we have every two years elections. Either municipal elections, 5,570 5, municipalities, uh, and now next year we have the, the federal elections which elect governors and the president and federal deputies and et cetera. And it means that the country is almost permanently in electoral processes, which is terrible. No? It's good that we have electoral processes, a representative democracy, but not every year. No, it's, it's terrible. So we are always under the purview of the electoral tribunals. And the uh, electoral law in Brazil is very restrictive, very restrictive. And uh, it's using the power of this electoral law. People you know, can say, take down sites, take down content on the internet uh, uh, with a local judge uh, using the powers of a local representation of the electoral tribunal and so on. And this, people look at Brazil and say, no, that's a very repressive country. No, no, it's not our electoral law when it's in, in force, like now, I think, uh, be beginning. Uh, the beginning of next year, we will be under the electoral law, law for all purposes um, of communication. The, we, we will be under that, and we have uh, f f respect the law. No, the law is there for this. So one of our big issues is to reform that law in order not to, to violate principles of privacy and of accountability of intermediaries and so on. So the civil rights framework will be av above that law if we manage to approve it. And we you know? uh, regarding net neutrality, what is the biggest challenge we have, which is the same as in Europe, I think? There is an organization of the big telcos, telecommunications companies, called Etno in Europe. And in Brazil, there is Cindy Tele Brasil, which run, uh, is run by the, five, the, the quintet of all transnational corporations. No, in, they don't, uh, the decision making is not made in Brazil, it's, it's made in Europe or Mexico or the United States. No? And uh, the, these companies are arguing that the net neutrality principle, as described by Luca, no, regarding the network, the, 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 the connection and transport of data of the network, they say, no, we have the same rights as Google. We want to peek into the, the traffic running through our cables and make money with it. So we have to, to peek into, into all the content like Google does, does in the sessions. No? And, uh, and we want to make the same money. It's unfair for us. That's the argument. No? And actually, they are doing that because there is no law, specific law, preventing that. They already peek into the network. There is a, in Australia, there is a big case with Telstra of the uh, uh, capturing all data and selling raw data to, to, to uh, advertising companies. No, and this is not illegal. The civil rights framework will make sure that this is clearly limited and cannot be done. No? And why? Why? What's the difference between Google and, uh, say, Telefonica or uh, Italia, Telecom Italia running the, the networks. It's simple that 
user cannot get into the internet if they don't pay team or pay Telefonica to get the broadband. This is a paid service, and without it, you cannot get into the internet. While Google is a voluntary service, you are not required or obliged to go there. It's a free voluntary service. No? Once you go there and you agree with terms of service, which nobody reads, no? uh, you are up to the conditions established by the free service they provide. And you are not o obliged to go there in order to navigate the internet. You can live without Google. I am probably the only person uh, in the entire universe that uh, I'm not in Facebook. No? And I can live with that. I'm, I'm, I feel OK. Nothing is happening to me. No? Uh, so um, th these are key points that we are fighting for. And uh, we hope to win because the, the uh, I'm finishing. Uh, just one phrase more. The, the, the uh, civil rights framework is in a fast track process in Congress. So the, all these forces are now doing their last efforts to make sure that they can change things, etc. But we'll know about it next, next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you, Luca. I think we're beginning to see a few points of connection, principles developed in, within the Council of Europe, their expression in local laws. Uh, there is a, a similar process going on between both regions. Uh, and we also, I think, have probably similar challenges when it comes especially to service providers and especially the powerful big telcos that Carlos just identified. I'm um, going to give the floor to Marie. I used to say here uh, in uh, Bali that I am a grandmother of data protection because I started in the 70s, right at the beginning, in order to we have in France uh, a law. The battle uh, started at the uh, Science Research uh, Center for uh, Computer Science. So it, was, it is not, uh, it is quite interesting. And then I have been in data protection at the Data Protection Authority in France, then uh, four years in uh, Brussels for the, to make the, the directive of 95, which is currently uh, revised. And I worked also with uh, international uh, organization, which took the, which took the subject. Uh, and uh, I, I, I help also as a, in capacity building uh, new DPAs, which raise, you know, which are set up by laws. Uh, uh, I have been in Africa, in Asia also, and uh, okay. Um, uh, it's only history that made uh, Europe uh, uh, needing uh, data protection uh, laws right at the beginning. It's uh, when uh, computers started to be used to manage enterprise. Before it was only uh, scientific huh, and military huh, uh, purpose. And right away when it was very expensive at that time, so uh, big enterprise and, and states were using those, not uh, small uh, enterprise, it was too, too costly. And right away people thought, well, information and data processing is power. So if they have uh, more power with information, what about us? And the principles that we all live on in the world uh, had been invented by the United States. The terrible thing is that the United States has not been able, for political reasons and economic reasons, not able to, to have a comprehensive uh, uh, framework for data protection, some laws, you know, sometimes when there is big rush. But that's the situation. Um, so I don't know if you need uh, me to recall what are the principles. What is interesting is that even today they are still uh, very useful. Even when you talk about big data, uh, you start by, think, by asking yourself, what is the purpose of the processing you want to do with the big data? Is it legitimate? Are the data uh, adequate with the purpose? you want to do, are, how long are you going to take it? You're going to make profiles. Oh, ho. well, we need some uh, new, uh, some better um, guarantees. And those will be in, uh, so, OK, that's the kind of questions that you always can ask yourself. But each time there is a new ITU, you think, oh, well, because 
the new IT are presented with, I would say, commercial words. So you don't see the, the link, but each time you can do it. Uh, what is the state of play? Uh, the Council of Europe, uh, it's uh, 47 states. 45 has a uh, data protection law. Of course, uh, each time there had been a movement of democratization, it had been very important, even on data protection. For instance, when uh, Portugal and Spain got, got out uh, the uh, dictatorship, right away in their constitution, they put the data protection principle in the constitution. When the, the wall went down in Berlin, it started also, and uh, it had been a mission of the Council of Europe to help all those countries about the rule of law. And, you know, with finance from the EU very often, but the Council of Europe was, um, I mean, it's, it's a human rights uh, organization. Huh? So they, they were in charge of helping all these countries to get uh, the rule of law, and inside there was the data protection. Because the Council of Europe adopted a convention, it's the only uh, international binding instrument on data protection with all the principles I told you, uh, because uh, or, 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 or the organization, the economic organization, OCDE, uh, adopted the guidelines not binding. At the beginning of the discussion on the convention, U.S. was there at the Council of Europe. And when they saw that Europe wanted to, to make a binding instrument, they went away and they made uh, only guidelines in the OECD. Then in 90, 1990, the UN adopted unanimously at the General Assembly all the principles, unanimously. But the UN didn't do, it, didn't do much since that. It could change but it will take time. But look at those principles. They are very technical, very interesting. The same that are in the Directive of Europe 95, which is uh, updated now. Um, this uh, convention is open to third countries. Uh, the first third country which uh, adhered to the convention is U Uruguay, 1st of August uh, this year. Morocco is in the process of adherence, and some, some other also. Uh, you know that since uh, 2000, many countries, uh, the, the rate of adoption of data protection laws in the world is go going fast. Huh? Uh, and since 2000, many. Uh, today, uh, according to uh, 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 a colleague from uh, uh, Australia, there are uh, 101 uh, countries with uh, data protection. The last one is South Africa, uh, last uh, September. And uh, the, as I told you, uh, the, the, the convention is on revision. The idea is that to, to get data protection sustain, sustainable with the IT going fast, you need to be sure that all the time the, the members of the convention, the parties, are still in, in, in uh, align with data protection. So uh, the new uh, convention uh, will have, s have several uh, aims. First, uh, no choice. The, all the parties have to apply data protection in all sectors, even secret services. Thank you. Uh, that was said two, two years ago, before. Huh? Um, electronic and manual data. Huh? Some rights are reinforced, especially regarding profiling. Huh? You can context, you can uh, know the logic which is behind uh, data processing and so forth. And the committee will, there is a committee, one party, one vote. The committee will assess the level of protection when there is an adherence to the convention, because you need to have a law to adhere to the convention. Uh, this is very good. Huh? And there will be assessment uh, every five years about. And also, what is interesting is that the principles has to be applied to particular sectors and so forth. And the Council of Europe already, through the, the committee of the convention, uh, elaborated a lot of uh, recommendations. 
uh, there are two very famous. Uh, the, the one on police, which became right away binding in, you, in EU, uh, from the Council of Europe. The telecom one, which is copied in many countries, even if the Council of Europe, does, which has not much money, doesn't go to, to make a lobby about their, their work, you, you find the, uh, the, 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 the recommendation in the law. I just I wanted to tell you that uh, uh, many of the, the countries of uh, Latin America as other countries, uh, other continent, had been invited uh, for the last, uh, the last uh, step for the adoption of the new convention. And uh, in, um, in uh, Latin America, those which had been uh, invited are Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, uh, Chile, Costa Rica, Equator, Nicaragua, and Peru. Because those started works, and I was hearing uh, our colleague from Brazil, and as I have been invited two years ago to Brazil, for the data protection draft law, I wish to know where you go, where you are, and we will be very interested to uh, continue to work on the applications through. So first the the modernization, and after that when you are with us, but you can contribute anywhere on the world level. Uh, so uh, I can give uh, other uh, details if you need uh, further on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. Um, I think it was, uh, yes, a, a quick in what she asked. Yes. The data protection law in Brazil is going through Congress now, and it's a very protracted process. Thank you very much. Um, I think an interesting point, the history of data protection in Europe had a huge impact in uh, Latin America in our own data protection laws. It's an interesting uh, thing you mentioned about the, tra the, the, the way uh, countries transitioning from authoritarian regimes begin to adopt these regimes and it, uh, it seems like uh, because of recent revelations, uh, it, it seems like an interesting uh, moment to reassess uh, these laws in terms, in terms also of, of transition, of transitional justice and so on. Um, Ana Lucia, please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Ana Lucia Lenis. I'm the manager of government affairs for Google in the and the region in Latin America. Uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm glad to be here. Uh, maybe uh, I want to, to highlight uh, some, uh, some issues about uh, data protection to continue the debate that Marie started. Um, I think that uh, I can share a little bit of uh, the experience that we have in Latin America. Um, uh, we have been involved in data protection debates around uh, our countries. We had uh, the Flelo in Mexico a few years ago, uh, the debate and the laws in Colombia and Peru um, last year, and the development of the regulation during this year. So we have a new data protection authorities in our countries. Uh, this debate, we have a, a, an open process in Peru, in Chile, sorry, and additionally we have regulation in Central America. So we see a lot of new regulation and new data protection authorities in our region, and it is very important uh, to continue this, uh, the, 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 the debates and the work, public workshops, the opportunities to debate and see the, what is happening in other regions, especially in Europe. We have the Ibero-American Network of Data Protection, so uh, this uh, is a forum that where, where we have the participation of European countries and Latin American countries uh, in, a, in a permanent debate about data protection uh, and the most important issues. And, Additionally, we, see, we are seeing a lot of local and regional international workshops in Latin America about this uh, important issue. Um, maybe I, I just wanted to highlight the importance of, of the protection of the privacy and the data. And additionally, the balance and the importance 
two of the free flow of information and guarantee both rights in the, in the legislation. So we had a lot of very interesting debates with the authorities, with the, with the congressmen, uh, with, co with government uh, about how to, co to concrete, uh, on how, on how to, uh, to, uh, to guarantee this balance in the laws and finally in the regulation in a very, very interesting debate in our region. So uh, this is an invitation to participate because we are still, uh, we have uh, open debates in around all Latin America. So maybe it is a good opportunity to highlight uh, the, the importance of the participation of all the stakeholders in the IGF in those processes and in our region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ana Lucia. Um, I, 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 was, I was asking about posing a question and I will throw to the table and maybe we can go back to it uh, during the debate, but I was wondering what kind of uh, measures can be taken not only to pass laws on data protection, but to make them effective. I mean, uh, there have been a few, I know of a few cases where the problem, the, 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 past, the, the part of implementation of these kinds of complex laws is, is a real challenge. And in Latin America, I think we have faced those challenges in several uh, laws that, of the kind we're talking about. It's interesting to think also about, for instance, the implementation of, of Marco Civil in Brazil in the future, to start thinking now about implementation in the future. Uh, and also uh, connecting uh, both points uh, that was mentioned before, in which ways powerful actors such as telcos can be uh, can be uh, made to abide by these laws, which is part obviously of implementation. Um, now, uh, Matthias, please, if you would introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Matthias. My first profession is I'm working in the Austrian government. I'm a legal expert there for nearly 20 years now and I'm the director for a department um, responsible for media policy and information society questions in the Federal Chancellery of the Republic of Austria. I've been involved in Council of Europe working for also quite a long time. I was chairing the steering committee and the mass media and meanwhile it's dealing with information society in general and I'm also very much involved in the EU and the digital uh, agenda, uh, which is, uh, let's say, the framework in this organization there. Um, my intervention will especially um, try to be a contribution um, to the general topic here of this workshop um, to share a little bit the experiences and maybe also best practices between uh, Europe and uh, Latin America. And I want to especially refer to one project that is actually underway in the Council of Europe. Um, it's based on the idea that uh, we all talk about here rights protection, we talk about data protection, we talk about access and so on. But the real question is, do people understand what we are talking about? You all are, I'm sure, not here in this event for a first time in an event like this. You all have met many friends maybe here. You often meet the same people. You often hear the same words. You often nod to each other because you're satisfied you have heard this, you, or you often shake your head and say, no, that's maybe absolutely not. But to be honest, aren't we a kind of closed circle here in the IGF or at all these conferences where we go and talk about internet governance? Have you ever explained, and I'm sure you have, have you ex ever explained to try very simple to people outside, what do we talk about when it's internet governance? Uh, have you explained in two minutes to somebody what are you doing at the IGF? Maybe you have and you will have maybe talked about access to internet. You will have explained to people it's about freedom of speech. You will have explained it's about your right to be in the internet, maybe to be anonymous. But that's it. What we saw in the Council of Europe, that there is a need for better understanding of the actions and behaviors of people, governments, and the private sector and other actors that can affect rights and freedoms in cyberspace. And the project that I uh, was mentioning is that the Council of Europe is now preparing a guide on human rights for internet users. Um, this guide should be 
a tool for everybody, not only maybe for the European PM people, but worldwide, a tool for everybody uh, to know about your human rights and the possible limitations. It should give you information and orientation, what they mean in practice when you go online, um, how they can be um, relied, how you can rely on it, uh, how you can act upon your rights, and especially one point here I want to mention is the access to remedies. Um, the question of the access to remedies um, of course is maybe the most crucial one. When your rights are uh, injured on the internet, of course the first question you get as a lawyer, what can you do? And what is the usual answer of lawyers often? Well, it depends, it depends. Um, to get an answer to the question, yes, but uh, who can uh, explain me then what's the final solution of the question, of the answer, it depends. First is you have to tell them where can they go. And um, so one important part of this compendium will be also uh, this uh, right of an, to an e effective remedy. And this is fully applicable to the internet, what we find in the European Convention on Human Rights in Article uh, 13, um, that everybody, everyone whose rights and freedom um, are violated, as set forth in the Convention, shall have an effective remedy before a national authority, and last not least, after the exhaustion of the national remedies at the European Court on Human Rights. And I'm not so much involved, let's say, in the American uh, Court of Human Rights, but, and, and the system differs also, because, for example, in, in, in Europe, in the context of the European Convention on Human Rights, we have the big advantage that individuals really can directly go to the European Court on Human Rights. Uh, what, what is, I think, not really possible in, in the American uh, system. Nonetheless, to go to the court and say, for example, my internet rights have to be infringed, um, this is often a long way. You know, it takes four years, five years, six years, so you have to know also what are your remedies, maybe on the spot. And this is, let's say, uh, quite a delicate issue because it's not only that you tell people, okay, go uh, to the next authority because which authority is responsible, go to the next court, but, and this was also expressed in this guide, remedies, effective remedies are corporate social responsibility. So it's not only a question of, let's say, the state authorities, but as we all know, and my friend from Google, for example, here, will know that very well. It's also a um, responsibility of the companies, of the, uh, um, let's say, stakeholders in various uh, positions. Um, why the state finally has a positive obligation, that what the court says, that also, that everybody is also protected from attacks to human rights from private companies. And so it's necessary that already private companies do on themselves think about um, strategies how to help users to understand their access to remedies. This is always covered in this compendium. I am very much happy to go more into details in that. I just uh, want to inform you that this handbook now is underway. There is actually a uh, consultation on it going on. We invite all stakeholders also to do a contribution to that. You will find it on the Council of Europe's website under Information Society. I say it very simple. You just Google it. Yes, Compendium on <laughs> Guide on Human Rights for Internet uh, Users, Council of Europe. You are invited and um, as regards the time, the adoption of the guide by the government, the Council of Ministers is scheduled for early uh, 2014. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, Lucia, you wanted to say something? Only a quick moment. Uh, we are um, 
thank you for your comments. <laughs> and, and we're taking notes. And additionally, I want to tell you that we are studying this, uh, this important document. And I'm sure that our European uh, team is going to participate actively in the debate about this, uh, this invitation for all the multi-stakeholders to, to, uh, to, to participate. And maybe highlight that this is a very good example of what we need for other regions, no? That the, the idea that if we are have to have an open debate about the concerns of the government or the different stakeholders and the opportunity to participate for everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, another short intro, uh, in, uh, sorry. You go ahead. <laughs> okay. So I just want to, to build up on what uh, they were saying uh, about remedies and about an open debate. Uh, about remedies, yes, it is uh, essential. Uh, coming back to, to the discussion on net neutrality, it is essential to define what is it, what is not, what, which are the limits, and uh, who, what are the remedies, and who is competent for the remedies, and how long does it take to reply to a, to a complaint. So, uh, <clears throat> two anecdotes about this. Uh, one is from uh, South America and the other one from Europe. So, uh, from South America, uh, Chile, uh, the, the authority that had to, uh, um, that is responsible, is competent to analyze the complaint, uh, was fined out as sitting on uh, thousands of complaints that uh, it didn't analyze because there, there was no rule that was expl explicitly specifying that he had to analyze in a timely uh, fashion. And another anecdote from Europe, uh, since 2009, the telecom package, its uh, directive uh, 140,009, states that uh, the, all the, uh, the, uh, when the, the measures that uh, defi define how content should be uh, accessed and used online should be compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. But it does not define who should apply the convention and how. So since four years, we know that measures should be compatible with uh, uh, human rights, but we don't know who has to apply them and how has to apply them. And the BEREC, uh, the body of the European uh, Regulators of Electronic Communications, has, has stated explicitly that electronic communication regulators do, are not competent for human rights issues. So we know that we have to apply them, but we don't know how, and no one has the competence to, to do it. So if I can add the last uh, uh, point, what is essential is to, have, it is to involve all the stakeholders in the debate, not just to be demagogic and say every, all, everyone has to, to speak, but to have a heterogeneity of point of views and to analyze all the different facets of the debate and know which are the issues that should be tackled and how to be effective. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I, I'm going to move to Claudio because we, I don't want to... Then we can open the floor to discussing all the issues where... Thank oh, you. thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Ramiro and ABC for the invitation. I think it's quite important to, uh, to have these conversations and to start thinking how uh, to connect uh, to why different uh, reality between what is happening in Latin America and what is happening actually in Europe. And I just wanted to, to, <clears throat> to share a little bit about what are uh, the reality and what are the practices that uh, at least we have in Latin America uh, and, and the example of the neutrality regulation that Luca uh, has uh, recently pointed out, I think is quite important, especially in the case of Chile, where uh, it was one, one of the first uh, countries in the world to have this kind of provision, despite of what Miguel, uh, present here, uh, can actually argue against. But uh, the point is, uh, it's, uh, it, I totally agree with what Luca said. I think it's quite important to not just provide uh, as, uh, remedies into the law, but actually to give the local authorities, you know, the, 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 the enforcement powers to just get over the thing and not just think, uh, not just talk uh, uh, beautiful words about what uh, neutrality means, but actually have the force to just enforce that kind of provision. But uh, I think it's important to, to, to go to other uh, issues related with what is happening in the region. And I think it's important, uh, at least uh, thinking into account, uh, two important issues that have been discussed in the last years. 
um, which is the cyber crime regulation that we have, and especially what's copyright and how copyright regulation and has been a very important um, ways to at somehow uh, affect human rights uh, from the point of view of, of, uh, of uh, rights of the users. And I think it's important to take into account a couple of, of experience or legislative experience that we have, have uh, that we have in the region in the last years, especially the case of Brazil, for instance, can be very interesting and it's very, it's very wide opening at some part. All the, the, the public drive and process that they have in the Marco Civil, despite of the fact that we don't have a very clear idea what will be uh, the last word there and what will be the results. But I think it's important to not just thinking about good examples, but also bad examples. And we have tons of them in the region, sadly. And um, I think, for instance, in the, the, the last example of, of Peru, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a new uh, cyber crime regulation was, uh, was, uh, uh, was discussed in the Congress in, 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 a, in a very short process of five hours. And, um, and actually it was a very complicated law. It has a lot of provisions, very complicated from the human rights perspective. And I think it's important to just take it into account why that is happening. And from the civil society perspective where I come from, uh, suddenly I just uh, hear a lot of ex uh, explanations for that. And especially when, I, when we're talking about uh, copyright, this is quite you know, clear. Because uh, from civil society, we always try to, to, to think about what are the reasons that why we have that kind of regulation. And one of the, the main explanations that, that came up and popping up uh, very easily, it's about that our Congress uh, doesn't have any idea about what it, the internet it is about. Uh, and actually, a, a lot of examples are related with that saying that, well, there's a lot of congressmen that doesn't use you know, any email at all. And that, you know, it's one of the most feasible, at least, uh, re, uh, explanations that why we have that kind of regulation. But, you know, I think the, the reality is uh, a way more complex than that. And that's not especially the case of why we have this kind of complicated regulation. And I have the feeling that the explanation for that is at least in two ways. The first one, it's because of the lobbying efforts that we have been facing. Maybe in Europe, it's, you have a more structured way to just you know, handle that kind of pressures. But in the case of Latin America, it's a whole different story. And it's so, diff it's so difficult to just having a, a more you know, a reasonable, reasonable conversation between all the stakeholders because of the pressure of these companies all over our governments. And, and, and I, will, I would like to, to, uh, to take what Mat Mat Matthias said about the better understanding of the, of the law. And I think that's a very important issue. And I totally agree with what you're saying, and I think it's a very important force that, we, that you're, what you're driving. And, and I think it's, it's something that can also uh, help us to explain what is happening into the region and maybe to have a more uh, uh, fruitful conversation into the region too. And, and I think, just because I'm running out of, out of time maybe, that uh, the force that the, the, the human rights, or from the human rights standards point of view, has been driven by, by Frank LaRue or for the special rapporteur Catalina Odero in the case of the Inter-American system are very, very important to just, um, this is something that I, that I talk about uh, yesterday in another panel, and about what the human rights standards that apply to the internet are. Because it's quite easy to just talk, you know, very uh, wisely about the thing. But I think it's quite important to just to set what are those standards. And in the case of Latin America, at least, we have a, a, a very important uh, uh, jurisprudence over freedom of expression, for instance, in our uh, international inter-American um, human rights system, uh, with, uh, which I think is quite important for all the actors taking into account to just uh, have a very more, you know, uh, uh, interesting conversation when we're talking about about that standards. And secondly, I think it's important uh, talk about the, the free trade agreements and how that uh, FTAs are affecting the way that our uh, our countries into the region are are taking into account all this discussion over human rights and the internet. And I think uh, nowadays the TPP or the Trans Pacific Partnership, it's you know by far 
one of the most complicated issues uh, uh, discussed in, at the international level and which uh, sadly we don't have very, very, pretty much information about because it's all secret, because we don't have any information at all about what they're discussing. Because even our congressmen doesn't have any idea about what our uh, governments are um, trying to achieve because of the, these FDAs. And actually the only information that we have, and this is the, you know, the, the, the only reason or the only explanation that uh, the civil society, the only information, sorry, that the civil society has about the thing, it's all leaks. And, uh, and the last leaks is actually was uh, in February of 2011, and it was the, the, a leak of the USTR proposals over copyright, which is, are so complicated, they're so against any human rights standards over freedom of expression. And actually, some of those uh, regulations are even more, uh, they go for, uh, uh, forward about what the, actually the U.S. A regulation they have on copyright. So I think that's a very important issue uh, to think about when we're talking about um, relationship between human rights and the internet. And, and finally, uh, I think it's important uh, to think about how to solve the gaps of information because the, the information gap that we have, um, it's one of the key issues when we're talking about this. Maybe when, if we have a more uh, feasible information about, what, about the discussions, about the standards and about the practices, can be so helpful for our um, regula regulators to just have a very, better understanding and therefore better laws applying to human rights and the internet. And I think, uh, and this is an example that I, I, I can talk a lot because uh, uh, I've been part of this co little coalition of civil society organizations on, into the region, uh, which is part of Derechos Digitales, of course, ADC in the case of Argentina, uh, Carisma Foundation in the case of uh, Colombia, and FGV in the case of Brazil. Uh, what we uh, have done in the last, in this 2013 uh, digital rights Latin American newsletter that I am inviting all of you if you're interested in discussing about what is happening in the region uh, to take a look at it and, and subscribe maybe to this newsletter where um, you have uh, eight different articles uh, and new articles each month uh, where the civil, this one of the most important civil society organizations on the region are you know, analyzing critically about what is happening in, 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 our, in the digital rights perspective. So I think it's important to, to solve these gaps. What civil society can, have, can do is very little and is very yeah, short term, but at the same time, I think it's important, and it's, this is at least this newsletter is a first step to solve a lot of information gap that we have, and I think uh, it's important for all of you to take that into account to just uh, to move on and have a better understanding of human rights issues into the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudio. We have a lot of issues on the table. I was going to try to summarize this, but I'm not going to do it. I'd rather have a, to start a conversation, so maybe if uh, the audience is interested, uh, we can take uh, two short comments, please. Um, somebody. Two, there are two here, please. Yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, Nicolas Zingales from Timbuk University. Um, one question I have is uh, for Carlos. Um, I was interested in uh, this framework of, that is uh, uh, proposed for uh, inter intermediary liability um, for, in Brazil, uh, where it says that basically the responsibility for the content, for the legality of the content, lies with the originator and not with the platform. Um, this is quite uh, innovative in my view and uh, it, uh, it can only um, uh, be replicated if one thinks that the uh, Communication Decency Act uh, in the United States that gives uh, immunity to uh, inter intermediary liability um, operators uh, when they decide over the uh, decency of the content uh, on the internet and so they are free to take down um, uh, at their uh, will, essentially. Um, so uh, my question is, in this regard, would this uh, give full immunity for any kind of activity, or is it restricted to any particular field? And what about also the other side of the coin? So um, when uh, an intermediary uh, is uh, essentially perpetrating a violation of freedom of expression by allowing a claim of takedown to take place, um, is it responsible in any way for the violation of this human rights? And then, if I may, I have also a second question regarding the general team. 
um, and it's addressed to, uh, in particular, the representative from the Council of Europe. Um, with regard to this new wave of uh, privacy laws um, that, has, that we have witnessed in the last uh, few years, um, would you agree with the assessment that uh, it's mainly about uh, the diffusion of the principle of transparency as opposed to uh, the notion of privacy as it was originally understood, so a reasonable expectation of the protection of personal information, uh, now it's more about the control over uh, the information that the government can acquire and um, the possibility for the users to uh, be informed about what the government owns uh, with regard to your personal information. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take one more comment, please. I'll, I would like the panelists' opinion on or considerations on how very low bandwidth and very low quality of service could impact human rights in the sense of, uh, especially considering the developing nation quality of most of Latin American and Caribbean, uh, in, consider in consideration of the type of content you actually have access to or what kind of stuff can you do online. You cannot maybe stream a protest that's taking place or if you're not if you don't have access to, uh, I don't know, free and open uh, TV media, you could make your own or you could enjoy uh, streaming services, but if your bandwidth is not allowable or good enough bandwidth is too expensive, how could that impact your human rights? And I also make, would like to make a quick point of, while well, I really enjoy the very productive high-level discussion on, on human rights online in, in, in both regions, I would like some to I would like the panelists to put attention to more basic discussions on very very important human rights issues and how they apply uh, online stuff like uh, I know for example in Venezuela the Huasa Fune, which is a very well known case, is being prohibited to talk on of their own case, but also she's being prohibited to use social media at all, so she can't even tweet to their friends or post pictures to their family without risking going to jail because nobody, because the government is trying to prevent her to speaking out but also limiting every other chance she has to communicate with friends and family. And uh, stuff like uh, pre uh, previous censorship, censura previa, uh, that's being built in many countries in the region but it also applies online. Thank you very much uh, for both questions. There were a couple, one that were addressed specifically and others to the panel. We have also remote participation. I would ask the panel if we can have a quick response very briefly to the questions that have been raised and then we can move to the remote participation. So whoever, uh, Carlos Afonso or Matias, please. Carlos Afonso. Um, the, the question regarding response, uh, accountability of intermediaries uh, in the Marco Civil is precisely to make sure that uh, um, there are uh, the, uh, the due process of law is, is uh, warranted for taking down content. That's the main focus of this, this component of the uh, civil rights framework. And uh, uh, one of the paragraphs which is there, uh, and we are fighting against it, is one which makes an exception for uh, uh, intellectual property rights content. And uh, the big media companies requested that there is a paragraph which allows them to require, to re to require content to be taken down if they argue that this is a violation of their outer rights or intellectual property rights without due process of law. And this is, is a thing that is unacceptable because, you know, you have to argue first if this, there is an intellectual property rights issue and you, you, you have to have the means to prove it before you take it down. So this is, these are the main uh, things that are there. Now, of course, you have providers who also generate content. And, uh, you know, in which capacity you are judging them or, or, 
or are they committing any uh, illegality regarding the current laws of the country, either online or offline? Many rights and many obligations are valid, valid online and offline. You know, are things that are in the, char in, in the constitution of the country, in, in the body of law of the country, irrespective of the media, mm -hmm. irrespective of the communications media. So this all is considered, of course, taking into consideration. But what is important is, uh, and also the banks are pressing very strongly for that, you know, that transferring to the host or to the internet service provider responsibility for a security breach in, 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 in e-commerce or in, in bank transactions. You know? And uh, uh, the phishing or whatever that happens is, is the responsibility of the host? No, it's not. No. If it is, it has to be proved first. And this is, this is the, the spirit of the law, it's not to, to, to allow providers to do what they want, not at all, absolutely not. No? Thank you very much. Uh, Matthias? Thank you very much. I just want to come back to the question of the gentleman's uh, point. Um, is it a human right to have, as, uh, as far as I have understood you, a kind of security that they have a quality of service on the Internet, a basic level, right? And this is, of course, I think one of the most interesting and most crucial points that have to be or are, of course, also discussed within fora like this. I mean, um, to get now an answer to, to tell you yes, in principle, I would say we have, you, you really have to look at this question from various views. But as regards the concept of the European Convention on Human Rights, the older conception, as it was seen by the by the European Court, the answer would have been maybe no. The answer would have been, well, state should not intervene, should give people their freedom, um, and if, if the state intervenes, then there, of course, there are remedies and so on. The concept within the last years, and together with the right of privacy, it's more than 20 years meanwhile, but also now with Article 10 of the Convention, it's more and more that the state should not only refrain, but really has a positive obligation to act and to really uh, more and more, you, you find in a repeated way, he really has uh, to take care of a kind of environment also for people that they can make use of it. But this would go now very far. Would it mean, and this is the question, that you have a right towards the state, to go to the state and say, I live in a region somewhere maybe here in Bali uh, because I, I was touring around in Bali also as a tourist a little bit. And when you talk to people 50 kilometers from here or so, um, and to young people, I spoke to a 20-year-old uh, man who was guiding me around in the rice fields. Uh, he was very smart. He was very open-minded, very interesting also what this conference is about. Well, and then I asked him, okay, do you have Facebook or so? Yeah, we can stay friends on Facebook or so. He said, I never have been on the internet so far. We have no internet. My parents, neither do we have it in the, in the village, nor, do, nor can my parents afford it. In the European co Union context, you know, where everything is seen from a very economic side and from a very uh, well-equipped side, um, this topic is discussed under the universal service. So there is the question, the states, for example, have the uh, real obligation, and this was within the last decades, that everybody has access to a public telephone. As regards Internet, European Union so far, and the European Union means member states so far, were very hesitant to say we give a guarantee by the state that everybody has access to the Internet. Nonetheless, I think this is especially um, the crucial point. And when you look from the Convention on Human Rights, um, you have the right to education, you have a right to knowledge, and you have a right to non-discrimination. Um, when I started my job 20 years ago, we had a court case at, in, in Strasbourg. It was about the Austrian broadcasting monopoly. It was the Lentia case. In this uh, Lentia case uh, decision, there is one sentence which is quoted all the time. The state is the last guarantor of pluralism. 
which was interpreted in the way that, well, if pluralism is not guaranteed, the pluralism of, be it knowledge, the pluralism of information, the pluralism of, be it maybe also access, then the state has to be active. And if we come now to a, um, and I think we are already in this time, that you can get the variety of opinions, um, the access to knowledge, mm -hmm. only by the means of internet nowadays, to have it in a non-discriminatory way, I would say we really should discuss and maybe fight for a kind of minimum access obligation of states. But I know this is maybe still a long way, although it might be frustrating, but I'm very grateful that you posed this question here. And it's also one of the points um, under positive obligations that have to be further discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for raising the issue of access and, and answering. I'm sorry, it was Claudio and, and Luca, yes. Uh, no, just a very quick point uh, about the, the, the question here. And, and I would like to highlight uh, one, one of the most, of the, my favorite uh, provision on the, on the military uh, regulation in Chile, uh, which is, um, uh, well, the, the Net neutrality uh, regulation in Chile was actually a reform of the, of the Telecommunications Act. And, um, and I think it's important this, uh, around the question that was raised because um, the Chilean uh, regulation used the word uh, arbitrariamente uh, in Spanish, which just means arbitrarily. And, and this specific word, at least in the context of Chile, means something very, very precise. And, and actually, in the case of Chile, we have a, a very important jurisprudence um, in the Supreme Court about what that word exactly means, because it's, it's used, uh, it's used um, in the, in the um, fundamental rights uh, uh, regulation. So, and, and what, uh, what the, the Supreme Court say, uh, said about what arbitrarily means, it's puro capricho, like pure whim at the end. So if you have any reason to just block or you know, to do any other activity against net neutrality, actually you are not usually you know, arbitrarily. So that's opened up a very wide you know, door to block, to restrict content, to prioritize package and stuff. So I think it's very important to just take this kind of, you know, of details into account when we're talking about regulation because uh, saying this or quality of services or any other uh, wide concept can be held, uh, used, and actually it is used, to restrict uh, important principles as uh, and, and Thank you. Thank you very much. Luca, uh, please be brief because we have a remote uh, participation also. Uh, so coming back to the quality of service uh, question. So um, in, there are, it is true uh, the majority of countries in the world, they have extremely low standard of quality of service. The uh, reply to this problem is to invest in network. It is not to prioritize, to manage traffic in discrimin discriminatory fashion. If you invest in network, you have more capacity for everyone. If you prioritize, you have more capacity for those who are able to pay and even less for those who are not able to pay. So you polarize the issue even more. Uh, as I was saying before, also, this reflects on the, the media pluralism, the diversity of media content. Uh, as Matthias was stating, the Council of Europe member have a positive obligation to uh, protect uh, media pluralism. I would add something on top of this. They have a, a positive obligation to guarantee an effective media pluralism. You can check the Di Stefano case in 2012. And so we know that there is a, an issue. We know that the traffic should be managed in an application agnostic fashion, so do not, not targeting specific content, not blocking the, the, the pictures you were mentioning about. And uh, the pro the, we, we now know that we have to solve the problem, uh, taking, taking into consideration not only best practice, but also worst practice, because it is useful to uh, follow example. It is even more useful to avoid negative examples. Uh, we have tried during the last three months to elaborate a model framework on net to, pr to protect net neutrality, trying to, tran to transpose the ITF uh, standardization process to policy making process, also following the example of the uh, Getulio Vargas uh, Foundation uh, in the elaboration of the uh, Marco Civil. 
and uh, tomorrow morning we will present the report of the dynamic coalition on net neutrality with the, and with the model inside so if you're interested to know how we have uh, uh, managed to elaborate an efficient solution uh, be tomorrow morning at nine at the meeting thank you very much luca uh, marie you wanted to <coughs> so there was a question uh, on, pro on uh, data protection say about the fact that maybe we are shifting from privacy um, aim to transparency business. Um, I would say no, it's uh, privacy in the sense of no abuse about your data when they are taken by others, no abuse, is still, of course, uh, on, on the table. And, and I could give uh, examples. But it's true that because so many things are going on uh, not visible, when you use your, uh, your smartphone, you don't know what's going on here. This is terrible. Uh, uh, well, uh, and I think we are, we are not enough on this question even. Huh? So uh, transparency, yes, more and more uh, it has to be said to the person concerned. What is the purpose of the data processing? What data, which person will get them? Uh, how long, even how long? You are going to keep them. And this kind of transparency uh, is a way also for you to control, but also it's a preventive measure. If the data controller tell you, has to tell you something, if he lies, it will be a problem. So he has to, it is more to be in conformity. Uh, now, uh, I would like just to add something also, also about our moderator who asked about effectiveness. I wish all the international services, those which sp spread over the world, would apply the laws of where they, are, they have users. And, uh, well, excuse me, Google, but uh, you know that uh, for one year and a half uh, in Europe uh, you have a problem, and that now you are going to get fines, very low level, you're lucky, but with the new gov the new directive, you will get uh, maybe 5% of your annual revenue. Okay, so please, and I would like to uh, ask a question to uh, all of us. It's strange that years before, when you were talking about uh, producing an object somewhere in the world, huh? uh, a bottle, huh? in, in somewhere to be sold on all over the, the world, any legal advisor will tell you take the more straight, uh, the, the more, uh, the, be, the best level of guarantees of, of prevention, huh? the, the norms, take the best norms, very often German. And so you can sell your product all over the world, no problem, because it will be at the, the best level of protection. Why? about uh, information services, it is not the criteria that all the legal person tell the, the responsible of services. And so we are in Europe, and you, you will be also, I'm sure, in this question of applicable law all the time. Huh? And all the American uh, companies refuse to apply the European data protection law. Of course, we know that it is because if they apply that law, they are afraid that tomorrow they will be asked to apply the tax law. That's the problem. Huh? But listen, we are in a, in a human rights question. Huh? You cannot do what you want with the data of others. There is no property on personal data. It is impossible. Huh? Personal data, it's your identity in the hand of others. There is no ownership on that. It is not possible. You have them, you have to respect. If you want to do something else with the data, please ask the person if it agrees. Or if, if there is a law which says you have to do, okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. I'm sorry, Carlos, I'm going to move to the remote moderation because uh, I was asked to. Marie, I'm going to ask you later about effectiveness, probably, just in, on a personal basis because we have a few problems in Argentina on that. Uh, Francisco Vera from Derechos Digitales is our remote moderator. Please, Francisco. Yeah. Uh, there's a question and a comment from Javier Pallero, de Argentina. Uh, first, his question. His question is for Carlos Afonso. Is how does the Brazilian net neutrality approach deal with traffic management? How is the mechanism for control and enforcement supposed to work? So he comments that he has a place like Chile that has net neutrality laws, but sometimes issues regarding control and enforcement arises. And then a comment to Claudio, his intervention, that human rights perspective over cybercrime bills in Argentina. Cyber grooming and the too broad definition of conduct stressing the use of ICTs over the conduct itself as a point of concern. This has clear implications regarding due process and even access to information because this, this encourages internet usage by deeming a dangerous technology. Yes, please, uh, Carlos, you may take the opportunity to make the comment you wanted to make before and also answer answer the question if you wish. Very quickly, uh, the uh, net neutrality uh, proposition in the civil rights framework does not talk about control, talks about no control at all. Packets must flow freely except for uh, technical uh, uh, characteristics which are obvious, like uh, you know, a streaming, all the packets must go in sequence. Beyond that, uh, for any other region, uh, commercial, religious, cultural, whatever you can imagine, except for very strict technical standards which be enforced by, so that the, 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 the transport of the data is optimized, they cannot be done, done by the, the telco or the internet service provider. That's the point, Not, no control at all, to the contrary. Thank you very much, much Carlos. Um, Yes, look yeah, up I just wanted to reply. I mean, uh, I think one has to be extremely careful with this. Uh, natural neutrality as freedom of expression, it is not something absolute. There are also some limitations, for instance, to give force to court order or to uh, national legislations. Uh, traffic management for, technical, for some technical reasons is essential, for instance, to for, to uh, prevent the uh, distributed denial of service attack, to prevent the proliferation of, of malwares, but it is also essential to uh, give force to uh, some court orders to uh, implement national legislation. So there are some, some limits have to be uh, to be uh, uh, defined for the respect of the rights of, of the others, as the uh, as freedom of expression. Thank you very much. Uh, Luca? Carlos Afonso, yes, of course. Very strong. Uh, just, just now, uh, the United States and I think Venezuela and a few other European countries are under a very heavy denial of service attack. Very strong. Um, terabits per second running. <laughs> um, and, and that should be one of the reasons that allows traffic management. Perfect. Um, we have a more, another comment from the remote yeah. moderation. It's really short. It's like he, Javier this says that his question was a bit misunderstood, or I did read that. Um, that he's actually talking about control over law application, over the enforcement part, rather than the uh, package or traffic management policies. Oh, I see. Um, somebody wants to take up on that? Otherwise, uh, is there someone in, in the audience who is willing to make a few short comments? Uh, we have to be wrapping up. Uh, yes, please, the gentleman. I would like to just make a small comment following up what was said by Luca. Uh, in respect of net neutrality, I would say the same thing when it comes to intermediary liability because it's usually discussed. Um, people like to say that you know, let's uh, limit the intermediary liability as much as possible because of freedom of expression, uh, right to fair trial. Uh, but there's also other part of issue, um, which is the right to effective remedy, which is quite often considered to be part of the particular conflicting right. So most of the people, when they talk about takedowns, they obviously think of IP. But it quite often also concerns personality rights infringement or privacy infringements. And in these cases, so there is a, I, I can, um, I think a quite good example is the recent, uh, the case from the European Court of Human Rights, which I consider to be crap, but it has a one good point. 
and this point is that if there would be zero liability for intermediaries, this would be infringement of a right to private life. And the reason is exactly because the effective remedy is integral, integral part of the right to private life. So if you cannot enforce the right because the uh, intermediary has no legal incentive to do something about it, and now this is not advocating for endless liability, but some, um, then it's also not a good idea. That's not a good for society. That's my only comment. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's a very important point. Uh, Valeria, please. Thank you very much, Valeria from the APC. Just a very um, quick comment, and not for the discussion because of a lack of time, but I just want to call the attention to the, to the trend in Latin America to institutionalize and legalize surveillance through a specific legal measures and practices, um, just to put on the table the issue. And let me just take the opportunity to thank you very much, for the speakers, for the great inputs, and the participants for for the debate and the reflection. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria. I think we should be wrapping up. Uh, I think a lot of issues have been raised and put on the table. We had discussed the laws that uh, we're beginning to see in both regions to be developed. Uh, we, there is an old history on data protection laws in both regions. There is a new history on net neutrality laws. In both cases, uh, the issue of um, Passing those laws is important, but also the, the phase of, of implementation, the, effect, the effectiveness of those laws, I, I believe, needs to be uh, considered from the very first moment. There is a need to educate, inform, and orientate, as Matthias uh, mentioned. And the question of remedy seems to be very important. We have, in both co uh, regions, we have probably the, most, the strongest uh, regional human rights systems. And there are similarities and differences between the standards that are developed by the different uh, uh, bodies of those systems. Um, and, and it seems uh, that we are putting a lot of uh, faith, uh, faith in, in, in a kind of top-down uh, approach that may give us the human rights standards and tools uh, to, to defend digital rights in both of our regions. And finally, we raised the issue of access, with, which obviously is absolutely important, especially in unequal societies such as the ones that we have uh, mainly in Latin America. I wanted to thank the participants uh, very, very much uh, for being part of this panel. Uh, sadly, we don't have any more time for discussions, but hopefully we can keep the conversation going afterwards. Thank you very much.